Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 15th uh, annual Jeffrey Bava Memorial Lecture. Um, we had our first lecture way back in 2003 uh, on the 23rd of July to celebrate Jeffrey's birthday in the year that he passed away. And since then, uh, we've been having this lecture um, every year. For a while, we moved it to May. Um, because of certain exams that students were having and so on. Um, and then once again, uh, we've decided to celebrate Jeffrey's birthday with the memorial lecture uh, rather than uh, something else. So, uh, this, so the, the, the uh, lecture has now moved to the closest Friday uh, to his birthday, which was the 23rd of July uh, this year. He would have been 80. Nine. Uh, um, uh, sorry, he would have been 98. In 2020, uh, he'd be that'd be the 100th anniversary of his birth. So, welcome once again uh, to this annual event. Um, and as you know, every year we bring in uh, a, an architect or someone associated with architecture to talk to us uh, about their experiences uh, in the field. Uh, and we've had a variety of people. And this year, we are very happy and um, proud to have Abba Narayan Lamba, a conservationist, uh, architect, uh, and really a personality uh, in her own right uh, from India with a practice in Bombay. Uh, Abba's firm, Abba, Nara Abba Narayan Lamba Associates, is an award-winning practice that has won over eight UNESCO Asia Pacific Awards for Heritage Conservation and has been selected among the top 50 architectural practices in the subcontinent uh, by Architectural Digest for many years running. The studio focuses on urban and architectural conservation as well as museums across India that include the conservation of 15th century temples in Ladakh, Hampi, medieval palaces, forts and caravanserais in Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Punjab, uh, Punjab master planning for ancient archaeological sites such as Odisha, Gujarat, and management plans for ancient Buddhist sites of Ajanta and Bodh Gaya have been some of the work done by the company. The practice has been in the forefront of urban and regional conservation in India, pioneering street furniture and signage guidelines for uh, Dada, Dada Bawai Narauji Road in Mumbai, and regional conservation plans for Shekhavati in Rajasthan, and several other things. The principal, Abhanar and Lamba, who's going to speak to you today, um, is, uh, has really been, been many things. And uh, in, on top of her sort of academic, con uh, 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 academic sort of, uh, his, her academic uh, achievements, she's also been a consultant for ICROM, Global Heritage Fund, and the World Monuments Fund, and has served on the heritage committees of both Delhi and Mumbai. She has been mentor to iconic museums, such as the Victoria Memorial Museum and Indian Museum in Calcutta, and the Rashtra Bhavan, the President's Estate in New Delhi. The firm has been appointed for the museum design and upgradation of the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library in New Delhi, memorial to the first Prime Minister of India, Mani Bhavan Gandhi Satir <coughs> Sangrahale in Mumbai, and the Nehru family homes of Swaraj Bhavan and Anand Bhavan in Allahabad. It is a consultant to the, he, he, she is also a consultant to the Ministry of Culture on the Freedom Movement Museum in the Red Fort in Delhi, and includes amongst its museum projects <clears throat> the Prince of Wales Museum in Mumbai, Chao Mahala Palace, Hyderabad, Bharatpur Museum, Lalbagh Palace, Indore, and Jai Vilas Museum. For nearly two decades, the heritage regulations of Bombay in 1995, Abba has been involved in conserving many of the 19th century Victoria, uh, Victorian landmarks and the precinct, and some of her projects in Mumbai include the restoration of the Town Hall and Asiatic Library, Royal Opera House, Convocation Hall of the Mumbai University, Elphinstone College, Tata Palace, Sir JJ School of Architecture, uh, Architecture and Art, and Municipal Head, Head Office and Crawford Market. Basically, the entire gamut of the monumental buildings of the Victorian period uh, in Mumbai has really had her hand touching it. Um, I, for one, have had the great privilege of also working with her. Uh, it didn't really happen, but we worked on a project together in Kolkata to conserve a very beautiful old palace and it's been a great pleasure, and she's one of the most wonderful people to work with. So she's not just a great achiever, but she's also a wonderful person in her own right to be and work with 
and I've had the great privilege of doing that. Um, I think Abba is going to share with us that whole wonderful experience of conserving our past uh, for the future. And I had the privilege of being at a conference that she had initiated last year, uh, and it really had the most wonderful title. It just said the future of our past. So Abba, I'd like to call upon you to deliver the uh, 15th Jeffrey Barber Memorial Lecture in 2017. Abba Lamba. Good evening. Thank you, Channa, for that introduction. Uh, but thank you to the Jeffrey Bava Memorial Trust, the trustees, Anjaledra and Channa, for, for this unbelievable honor because, like most architects of my generation in South Asia, uh, one grew up uh, admiring the work of Jeffrey Bava. And he was one of you know, the reasons uh, that I became an architect. And I think uh, after this lecture, I've told my studio and everyone back home that I'm just gonna go on holiday and just soak it in for the, for the rest of the year because uh, it's, it's truly, truly uh, a great honor. Uh, and I think the greatest gift that Jeffrey Bava made to architecture in South Asia is to create a language of architecture that was contextual. And unfortunately, in India, we don't see such a strong voice of building in context and architecture in context. And I think that is something that we have to so much to learn from, from Sri Lanka, where the voice, the design voice, has not been subsumed by commercial chaos and sort of the urban confusion that we see in, in most of the cities uh, in India today. So basically, when we look at uh, our shared heritage, at least of South Asia, uh, one of the greatest uh, aspects of, of this is that we're rapidly losing most of our historic buildings. And there needs to be this constant tug of war that needs to be balanced to to keep some space for the old uh, when, when we see this uh, urban implosion, really, of the way our cities are going. And uh, I'll take you through some of my work, and I'll take you geographically to the far end and the northernmost tip of India, a project that I worked on, uh, a Buddhist site. This was the 15th century temple of the Maitreya Buddha in Ladakh. And to just give you a sense of context, Ladakh is a high altitude desert, really. It's, uh, the, the, monast uh, the temple stood at a height of 11,000 feet, and uh, the temperatures go down to minus 30 degrees uh, Celsius in the winter. So all roads to the site are closed between December and May, and, and the way up to this, mon uh, to this temple was really walking up this amazing landscape. And uh, in the year 2003, this, this 15th century primarily mud and wood temple had been declared among the 100 most endangered monuments of the world. And since this was not owned by government, there was no funding. So what the villagers came up with was with the most innovative idea that conservation, that I had heard in conservation, that they pitched for a World Monuments Fund grant, uh, which was the Wilson Challenge grant, where World Monuments Fund only gives 50% of the required money and expects a matching grant. And instead of pledging dollars, the villagers got together and the Basgo Village Committee pledged labor and material as their 50%. And this was truly an honor for me to work with uh, for a project as an architect because I was the only outsider, really, who was working on this project. I was the only architect slash, uh, you know, non-Ladakhi. And the rest of the team was local Ladakhi, the, the villagers, the memes, uh, as the patron, the Raja of Ladakh, and the local community. And there was no contractor. It was the local community that was part of the restoration and conservation of this site. And this is what the site looked uh, when you started the work season. And because we could only work between May and October every year. It took us three years to really complete the project. Uh, so this is what the condition of the building looked like. It had these beautiful 15th century wall paintings and primarily every surface of, 
of the temple was, uh, was really covered with rich uh, painting. And as part of their contribution, you can see uh, that for the willow that was used for the roof of the ancillary structures, every house has one willow tree in their backyard. So every house of the village provided willow as their, their contribution to the effort. And before we started the project, uh, we, to bring up material, the villagers would form these human chains and carry material up, up the hill. And that truly is what I think conservation stands for because when you're conserving something, you're not just conserving the tangible, the, the built space or, or the architecture, but you're con conserving a way of life. You're conserving an identity of, of that community. And I think that's really key to, to conservation projects. So before we started the work, there was a puja and the Rinpoche came and there was a desec uh, consecration puja. So the, the soul of the Buddha was wrapped in silk uh, around a mirror. And that's when our team, which was the labor force, could walk in with their helmets and hard hats and work on this project. So instead of using alien materials that would not be, that were not part of the language, the built language of Ladakh, uh, I made a conscious decision that we would only use local materials. So we did not use metal or bamboo scaffolding. We made buttresses out of mud blocks. And that way we could make sure that the local labor that were, were conversant with that uh, technology uh, did not have to look outside for an engineer or an outside specialist and they didn't have to look outside for material as well because for this entire project we spent 15 lakh Indian rupees and uh, I think that by itself says a lot for the kind of uh, the, the material and the labor optimization that this project had and this is, is the team, uh, as you can see, even, even the Raja of Ladakh uh, was part of, of the team and everyone sort of did their little uh, bit. Uh, we worked in very difficult circumstances. There was no electricity, there was no running water. Uh, there were Ladakhi loos, which are basically a hole in the floor. And uh, I haven't, uh, I didn't bathe on this site for five days in a row and uh, would go back uh, uh, I mean, looking like a ragamuffin every time. But I think what this project taught me was that very often we as architects sort of tend to bring in our preconceived ideas of what is conservation and what is the right thing to do. But eventually it has to be a two-way process. And everything from being able to identify the wood to, to understanding that there were not one type of mud, but six types of mud, zasa and, and various markhala, which are used at different, at different consistencies, in different mixes, at different times, in different parts of the building. That is something that was part of the traditional local knowledge that no conservator could bring to the table. So it's as much as listening to the, to the, old, the local memes who knew how to deal almost intuitively with those mud plasters. Uh, that was really a learning curve. So the first year, uh, we didn't do much, I just learned, and pretty much we tried out samples of various uh, mud mixes. We did a little test pit on the mud terrace, and when we did a test pit, there was almost two to two and a half feet of mud on the wooden uh, uh, the roof, and that was the reason it was overloading and stressing the roof that the entire uh, the structural system had sort of sagged. And that's because over 500 years, every time it would rain, they would just throw fresh mud uh, as a kind of a waterproofing. And that buildup of mud had created a huge overload on, on the structural system. But the greatest surprise was when we did this little test pit at the bottom, just above the timber boarding, uh, I found birch bark. And uh, because my, my grandfather was a forester from Jammu and Kashmir, I was able to identify this as being birch bark. And interestingly enough, birch doesn't grow as a tree in Ladakh, which meant that it would have, 600 years ago, been brought from the hills of Kashmir Valley. And then came the other question of how do you bring birch from Kashmir to uh, Ladakh, uh, and this was at the peak of militancy. So we actually had to work hard to look for a, Kash a local Kashmiri intern who helped with this, the, the collection of fallen birch 
in the forests and then it was seasoned for a, a whole winter in Ladakh to remove the moisture and then used as a waterproofing solution. Uh, so after three years, we managed to reconsecrate this huge, so it's, the, the, the Maitreya Buddha statue rises up three floors and this was finally the whole consecration process was done. And uh, we won a UNESCO Award of Excellence for this project in 2007. But I think more than that, I think I just won some, earned some good karma. And soon after, I was uh, uh, appointed to work on the management plan of Ajanta Caves, which is another, uh, I, it's probably the most beautiful uh, site that we have to offer in India because right in the middle of a forest is this beautiful Buddhist site of rock cut temples and monasteries uh, and the highest uh, sort of form of Indian classical art. And from then on, uh, I, I was blessed and I managed to work on uh, the management plan for Bodh Gaya. And I think this project was interesting from the point of view of the fact that this is one of, it's one of uh, the world heritage sites that India has. It is a living monument, it's a living temple. But interestingly, it's not under the archaeological survey of India, like most monuments and most great sites of India are, and it is still administered and managed by the Bodh Gaya Temple Trust. And in the 19th century, there was a massive restoration slash reconstruction project that was headed by Alexander Cunningham of the Archaeological Survey of India for Bodh Gaya. And when you look at old photographs and archival photographs, you realize uh, just the extent of damage and then the extent of reconstruction that happened on this site. And at that point, when, when we in Asia look at conservation and we sort of refer to the more Western ideas of the Venice Charter and the Athens Charter and the Florence Charter, that's where one sort of questions whether we need to have a South Asian charter because our sensibilities, our philosophies, as well as a lot of our sites are so different that sometimes you wonder that is the identity of, or is the, the, the sacredness of that sacred geography sometimes more important or is is the core essence of the intangible uh, sometimes far more important than the built? And I think that has to do with our shared philosophy of both Hinduism and Buddhism and that whole idea of, of a cyclic, uh, uh, you know, cycle of life and birth and death and rebirth. And I think it came to the fore with the bomb blasts that happened in Bodh Gaya. And they happened a day before my team was visiting. So we really landed the very next day. And it was just sad to see the kind of, of desecration and the kind of damage. And, and more than that, I think when you see terrorism happen, it's also in Bombay we've we faced uh, terrorist attacks in at the Taj uh, Hotel, at the Gateway of India, at the Victoria Terminus. But if you look at the, the psychology of it, eventually, why are they hitting out at heritage buildings? It's because nothing else uh, relates better to a people's psyche than their historic icons. And I think that is where it's so important to have risk management in place for historic sites, because that's what they're really hitting out at, at the identity of it, not so much the building of it. Uh, so we worked for a year on the management plan. And again, the beauty of, of Bodh Gaya is that it's no, it, you cannot sort of club it under the head of an Indian site because throughout history there have been grants from the Burmese, from the Sri Lankans, and to this very day, this is really an international community of, of people who come there for, for pilgrimage. But again, when, we were, when I was looking at researching on really the conservation aspects of the building of the Mahabodhi temple and how much restoration happened, how did it happen, there was very little actually written material that I could rely on. And other than a few Archaeological Survey of India annual reports, there was really very little. And then seren serendipity happened. And I was going through a completely random set of archives. And I came across uh, something called the, the Bodh Gaya case, which was a criminal case, which was filed by a Buddhist pilgrim in the year 1895. 
and it had nothing to do with conservation. Uh, there was a man called Dharmapal who was a Buddhist pil pilgrim from Sri Lanka who went to Bodh Gaya and he felt slighted by the way he was treated and therefore he filed a litigation uh, before the British collector of Gaya and interestingly in that, as part of the recordings and the proceedings of that case, they got Joseph Begler, who was really the man of the Archaeological Survey of India at site, because Cunningham got all the credit for it, but it was really Begler who was there supervising the whole project. And Begler had to write a testimony. And as part of his testimony, I found this long description of everything that went in, in, in the site. And, and you have the strangest, uh, this is the man who, who really was credited, who is the man behind the whole conservation of the Mahabodhi temple. And he found not just, he went looking, hunting for bricks because he had to, he had this task of putting back the building and there were missing bricks. So he mentioned the neighboring sites where he looked, went hunting and scavenging for bricks of the same period. And once he had completed the reconstruction of the four shikharas around the main shikhara and he had worked on the conservation of the built form, he had to go looking for a, an idol of Buddha. And because there was none when he got the, the site to work on. There had been series of invasions, there had been willful desecration of the temple over, over layers of history. And then he mentions that he walked into the, the ashram of the Mahant. And interestingly enough, there is, still a, there is still a Hindu ashram not so far from the main temple, which is still has a, a dynastic sort of Mahant. And he then mentions that the Mahant offered that you could take any, any idol that you want. And he wandered around hunting for the right sculpture. And here is this man who is not Hindu, not Buddhist, not even South, not from South Asia. And he's given this whole job of putting the temple together. And then he found a, a, a statue of, of the Buddha, which he thought was appropriate. And to the left, you can see an old photograph where he put the statue back in place. And then he mentions that that he placed this, he, he did not personally stay in the sanctum sanctorum when the statue was being placed because he felt it was not his place by not being a local and not being a believer to be part of this process. And he says, I stepped out of the sanctum sanctorum when they did the Abhishek. And then he mentions how the Mahant applied vermilion on the, on the idol. And then he mentions how just in a matter of a few weeks, people started making offerings of gold leaf and silver leaf. And today, the entire statue is gilded. So what started off as a, a stone statue was really reconsecrated by pure faith. And today, it is the center of, of the Buddhist world once again. But that's, that raises this question about conservation, that how far do you go as a trained sort of professional? And where do you really step back and let faith take its, its course? And uh, I, that's, that's a question I'm still looking for an answer. But this is, these are some pictures of Bodh Gaya as it's emerged and evolved over the years. And then again, the question of faith came in because it is now a World Heritage Site. And when we were still working on the management plan, a group of pilgrims from Thailand made a proposal to the Bodh Gaya Temple Management Committee saying that they would like to gold plate the Amalak right on top of the Shikhar of the Mahabodhi Temple. And that led to a huge amount of debate between the Archaeological Survey of India and the Ministry of Culture and the Ministry of External Affairs that do you allow a World Heritage Site to be willfully changed and intervened, not for any reason of safety or for you know, concerning the, the uh, legitimate extension of its life, but actually an intervention that is not required. And again, if you look at all the charters of conservation, uh, this would be considered, you know, something that's unnecessary, is against authenticity, is against, goes against every principle of conservation. And I was part of that whole process of the master plan. And then we said, no, we will allow this to happen because Bodh Gaya and the Mahabodhi temple is still a living tradition and we cannot freeze it in time. So the fact that for the last 
800 years and more. There have been gifts to the temple from different parts of the world. There have been gifts of both new additions as well as restoration. So we have no right to freeze the, that uh, and to freeze that intangible in today's time. And we allowed that to happen. And I, I think uh, there were just two women who went up the scaffold right to the top. And it was, you know, for me, one of the greatest literally highs of my life to go right to the scaffold and, and go to the top of, of the temple. Uh, but again, when we talk of identity, so conservation and buildings of historic value often hold together an identity, whether it is a religious identity or a political identity, or sometimes an identity of a region. And for that, uh, Punjab is an interesting case because Punjab was sort of severed as, as it, it's, Punjab means the land of five rivers. And uh, today, if you look at Punjab, there, barely, there are no five rivers in either Indian Punjab or Pakistan Punjab. And that's because it was bifurcated and divided uh, during Indian independence into two countries, India and Pakistan, and then further divided in India into three states, which is Haryana, Punjab, and Himachal, and uh, the city of Chandigarh. So, for the last 70 years, there's been a kind of a willful, uh, in a sense, ignoring the past, because perhaps the past was too painful, because more people lost their lives and more people lost their homes uh, in the, the act of partition than any other event in history. And uh, therefore, what when we talk of Punjab and culture, very often people tend to dismiss it, saying Punjab really is only agriculture. There's no, no culture to Punjab. Uh, but the case in point is this Kila Mubarak in Patiala, which is one of the most beautiful complexes and was really decrepit because of willful neglect almost over 50 to 70 years. And this is the quality of some of the interiors. And it's because the Maharajas of Patiala sort of emerged, their power base emerged in the 18th century at the time that the Mughals was declining. And really architecture and art, and I've been discussing this with Dayanita over the last two days, is a lot about patronage. Because for a good architect, it's equally important to have a good client, that he can have a, a relationship of trust. Because if that does not happen, then that creative process is really not complete. And that's what happened towards the decline of the Mughal Empire, when craftsmen from the Mughal court were really looking for new patronage. And so within this little new principality and this new kingdom of Patiala, you, what he was able, Ala Singh was able to draw the finest craftsmen from Agra and Delhi, uh, from Shekhavati and Rajasthan, as well as you know, artists who were trained in the miniature style of Basoli and Kangra and the, uh, the hill regions of the Himalayas. And this sort of all converged in this great uh, palace with every little square inch of, of shish mahals and gold leafing and mirrored halls and palaces. And to the level that if you go back it, to, to the left, you'll see an image where uh, the Maharaja of Patiala went to a shop that was selling chandeliers in Calcutta, and there was a, a company called Osler and Company, which was a firm uh, from, from Ireland that made chandeliers, and they had one store in London and one in Calcutta, because all the Maharajas and the, and the British were buying up these chandeliers. So when the Maharaja of Patiala walked in without his sort of entourage and asked the price of a chandelier, the, the salesman sort of dismissed him and said, you can't afford it, and he was just so livid that he bought up the whole shop. So there's this Darbar Hall, which is just has every conceivable size of chandelier, but nothing matches anything else. And our, our biggest challenge over the last three years working on this, this site is, you know, how on earth do you restore something like this and be able to put back things? But it, it's, it's really a wonderful site to work on. But I think what's really helped with conservation building up uh, you know, in this area is it's, we are sort of trying to build that level of craftsmanship back because for 70 years, nobody used lime mortars and lime plasters because everyone resorted to cement. So to be able to train new masons in the skills of Arayesh plaster and lime plaster and all the traditions, as you can see, uh, we, we really had 
the oldest, I mean, uh, uh, the craftsmen who were then training the younger generation were in their 80s because nobody younger than that really knew how to knock lime or to use lime plasters in conservation. So we had to use literally geriatrics to help train the younger generation. But hopefully this is something that will become, uh, you know, an engine for, for fostering and for, for using like an incubator for making sure that the next generation does understand the skills that are needed for conserving uh, these monuments. And this is another fantastic site. And again, you can see the, you know, so the years of neglect uh, and the havoc they've wrecked. This is a Mughal Sarai from uh, Jahangir's time. And uh, Mughal Sarais were caravan Sarais that were dotted along the highway between Lahore and Agra. And after a few kilometers, they would, be, they would have this Sarai. And Punjab is, has some of the finest Mughal Sarais that are extant. And if you can see here, it has a very square geometric form, but when we were given this work, half of it had already been completely demolished and, and the brick had been used, salvaged for other construction. So we were only left with half uh, a caravanserai. And these are some of the drawings of, you know, we were mapping out uh, the areas of intervention. So here again was the question that do we conserve, while conserving, do we build the whole thing, or do we build only half? And we to make a very conscious decision that we'll only re restore and conserve the half that stays. We will not recreate the half that is gone. But the half that does stay, which also had missing vaults and missing cells, we reconstructed them perfectly, and we reconstructed them using Mughal tiles, using the traditional materials, and whether it was lime, slaking it on site, redoing the terraces in that same manner, because this was a replicable cell. So it wasn't conjecture, but it was the fact that there was a certain geometry that was so repetitive. But doing that, we were able to bring back a lost technology that was true, was indigenous to that region of brick vaulting and uh, that sort of structural system. And over the last two years, we've managed to conserve the of the cloisters, and hopefully in the next few years, this would go back to being a living sarai. So to bring back tented camps and to open this to visitors and tourists. And again, when we talk of identity, what do you do in a fractured history? When, when Punjab was divided, it was divided on the basis of religion. So East Punjab that came to India lost the Muslim population, and West Punjab that went to Pakistan lost the Hindu and Sikh population. So what do you do about the future of, of religious sites that do not have a constituency? And this is the case of the Moorish Mosque. This is one of the most amazing and, in a sense, schizophrenic settings because it's in the middle of Punjab and the architecture is not of the area at all because uh, Jagajit Singh, who is the king of Kapurthala, was a Francophile, so he commissioned a French architect to build a model of the Qutbiyah Mosque in Morocco. And suddenly this Moroccan model was transported and transplanted into the Punjab landscape. But it's, it, that makes it special because there is really nothing like that in India. And this was the sort of the condition that we found this uh, when I started working on this two years ago. And uh, as you can see over, and here again, if you go back to the first slide, you can see that our craftsman is definitely over 82 years old. So that's, these are the only people who really knew how to deal with these materials. And uh, piece by piece, we've put back the mosque, we've restored the, the sahan, which was a marble uh, courtyard. Uh, we've looked at the minarets, we've brought back the, the, uh, the glazed ceramic tiles. Uh, the garden had a beautiful charbag, which was a formal Mughal garden with orchards of, of uh, apricots and pears and oranges, and we've begun planting them. It'll obviously take a few years to really come into its own, um, but again, the greatest source of information and learning for me was an oral source because the grandson of uh, the Maharaja of Kapurthala is Brigadier Sukhjit Singh, who was a little boy when his grandfather inaugurated this mosque. And his memories of the colors and, uh, and materials that were missing or elements that were missing, for example, the light, the chandelier that hung had been removed long ago, but he remembered that there was a chandelier. And so when we would work on color samples, we would bring 
uh, Brigadier Sukhjit Singh to cite, and he would pick the one that he remembered as being the, the right color or the right tone or an element that had gone missing. And sometimes that, again, is, some, as a, is a learning curve because it's not just what you bring to the table as a professional, but very often what you learn from people who've intimately been associated with that structure. And now the lights are back in, and we hope to have this opened and you know, given back to the public uh, uh, within a month or two. Uh, and again, sometimes when you talk of public, public perception of uh, a historic site is so important. And uh, this is Jaipur. It's the walled city of Jaipur. It's an 18th century planned city uh, that was planned by Raja Jai Singh. And uh, today it's choking up because of traffic. And what a walled city was not designed for this sort of uh, traffic. And as a result, today when people visit Jaipur, they tend to avoid going to the walled city because just because they say, oh, it'll take us one hour to, to get in. And so the government came up with the idea of an underground uh, metro line, which would go from one, from under one uh, gate, which is Chandpol, and, and exit out of another gate of the walled city, which is Surajpol. And that's where public perception is so important because there was a very concerted media campaign that was very, very uh, much targeted at this whole underground metro line, and they were saying that, you know, this, the surface, the soil is sandy, and, you know, the city was really built on sand, and then if you start tunneling in, and what if everything collapses, and you have the Hava Mahal and the Jantar Mantar and all these amazing monuments just sort of crumble away, and uh, so there should be no underground metro. But again, when you look at all historic cities, whether it's, it's Athens or London, you also realize that the car does more damage and, and vehicular pollution does more damage to a historic city and what you need to do is pedestrianization and how do you do that other than resorting to creating mass transportation solutions. So, for, you know, it was, as a conservation architect, it was an interesting marriage to be working on an urban transport project. And uh, so the first thing that we did was to map all the streetscapes and this is what was going to happen. The tunnel boring machine, this is the picture of the tunnel boring machine outside the wall city. And the machine was going to burrow under that arch. And the arch barely had any foundations and it was really on sandy soil. So my team and our structural engineer, we were literally monitoring the progress of the TBM. And the monitoring was sort of both online and on site. And we had then put such strict markers that even for a one millimeter deflection, if we saw a one millimeter deflection, alarm bells would go right up to the chief minister's office. So there was a very intense monitoring. But if you can see the image on the right, if you don't do that, this is what's happening. It's choking up and the city would have died. So we started with this exercise of documenting the historic streetscapes and looking at the way the, the tunnel boring machines were going to come in, if there was an impact. But while we were working on this project, and these are the two sort of squares under which the stations were going to be made. And uh, this, these are called Badi Chopper, which is a large chopper, and the Choti Chopper, which is a small square. And this is an image of, a contemporary image of uh, the chopper. And this is what it looked like. It was like a municipal water body with those fake fountains and painted blue. And when we started, when the team started researching on this project, we found an old photograph by Raja Deen Dayal. And this, if you look closely, sort of indicates that there's something in the middle which is not that water tank that we found on site. And then we looked closely and it looked like a kind of a step well. So we went back to the chief minister and said, ma'am, we think we've found some idea that could well be a step well under Bari Chopper and Choti Chopper. So we have a choice. We either continue with the schedules or we really rethink the station and take the station level six meters bef below what it's designed for. And that would result in you know, time delays and not meeting our deadlines. But this might, if it's still there, might be able to save a historic site. And without batting an eyelid, she said, save that step well if it is there. So we, we recalibrated all the engineering drawings, shifted the, the station six meters below grade. And so this is a, a sectional view of how the station was then designed so that you could actually exit the station and enter the water body, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the step well, and then exit into the center. 
And then we did a complete archaeological excavation on site. And we had a team of archaeologists and a team of historians and a team of architects monitoring this. And lo and behold, they hadn't actually destroyed the step well, they just filled it up. So what really happened was that when initially the water supply to the city came through kanats, which is underground tunnels that would draw water from a very distant hill uh, through an underground tunnel into the center of the city. And the moment they got piped water supply, they thought it was irrelevant and they filled it up. But there was a hundred years when nobody saw and nobody remembered. So there was nothing like public memory or, or anybody in living hist uh, you know, in, in the living world who knew that there was a kund. And therefore, when we started this, we were just so happy to find the central fountain that we were able to save and find these beautiful cow heads that were supposed to be the actual water spouts. So each one has been numbered, every stone has been numbered, and then moved to the, the Albert Hall Museum for safekeeping. And now when the tunnel uh, boring machine has done its job and the station is ready, each piece of stone is going to be set back in a process of anastylosis. So doing this is probably, you know, at least in the Indian context, was, it's, it, it, it's been the most interesting project to work on. And the idea is that once this comes through, this could not only pedestrianize the city, but it could create a beautiful, like two beautiful uh, step wells, recreate them and, and be able to pedestrianize and use these for cultural performances. And uh, now we are currently working on lighting up these buildings around it. So in a couple of years, this whole project should come through. And finally, coming back to the city where I've been working for the last 22 years, uh, and, and more the realm of, of uh, my conservation practice, which it really has focused on, on 19th and 20th century architecture. And uh, I think personally that that, that that is something that Sri Lanka also has a great amount of, but 19th and 20th century architecture doesn't find so many takers in the Indian context, because, or in the Asian context, especially the South Asian context, because in our cultures, when our history dates back to built history of 5,000 years and 4,000 years and 3,000 years, then this seems too recent uh, a building to really bother about. And I think it's that myopia uh, that led to the fact that in a country as vast as India, we only have 3,900 odd structures which are protected under national protection. And if you look at a city like Bombay, for instance, the island city does not have a single site under protection by, by the national government, which means there's a complete, you know, you, you completely neglect and in, ignore a very important and vital aspect of our built heritage. And I do hope that the same thing would not happen here and that the Jeffrey Bava buildings would soon be nominated and protected by law because we, we cannot afford to lose this layer of our heritage. So then it's, it's great to know that by default, Chandigarh, which is Corbusier's uh, creation, without getting national protection, managed to sort of double jump and take a, uh, you know, a leap of faith and has been declared a World Heritage Site. Uh, and we've been, my team and I have been working on, on uh, the conservation plan and the conservation of the Capitol complex, which includes Corbusier's greatest masterpiece of uh, the High Court, the Assembly Building, uh, and the Secretariat. But coming back to, to Bombay, uh, what we've, I've been working with, you know, a whole bunch of local activists and citizen groups is trying to bring that level of acknowledgement to being able to protect Bombay uh, especially its 19th century Victorian and its 20th century Art Deco building, and be able to give it the status of a World Heritage Site. And I think this journey really began because of the fact that even a World Heritage Site like Victoria Terminus is not a protected monument, because uh, according to the Archaeological Survey of India, if something is not 100 years old, it's really not worth preserving. So um, until very recently, the VT was not 100 years old, and therefore it's not a listed national monument. Uh, but not just that, what Bombay then did is by virtue of the fact that it had no national protection and therefore no national funding for conservation, Bombay developed its own language and its own citizens' reaction to being very jealous to jealously guarding its heritage. And I think that has, so, in a sense, created a new paradigm for conservation in the South Asian context. Because in 1995, 
Bombay became the first city in India to create something called a city regulation, which was the heritage regulation of Greater Bombay. And what it did was to make two very important changes. One, it shifted the perception that had been always monument-centric. So you looked at Taj Mahal and you only looked at you know, the fence around Taj Mahal and didn't really wor worry about the urban context of it or what was happening in terms of new development. So when by, by this 95 heritage regulation, what Bombay did was to say that not just individual buildings, but neighborhoods are important. And therefore, certain areas or heritage precincts were designated as being important. So this, for example, is a building which might not reach grade one status or grade two status, but or it might not be architecturally the most superior, but it brought in values that were religious or cultural or socioeconomic as factors that were important to be saved. And therefore, it sort of re rethought the whole process of conservation in India. And uh, in 1998, I, uh, I worked on a proposal uh, for urban guidelines for this very busy artery in the heart of the city, which is the Bhai Nauroji Road. And uh, what the problem with that was this is a commercial district and it was just completely covered with billboards and shop fronts and just a visual clutter of signage. So uh, over nine months, uh, we mapped and documented every structure on the, on the road, every building, mapped what the usage patterns were, what the ownership patterns were. And this was the condition. There were like sort of just random billboards and random shop fronts. So in 1999, when I completed the project, I presented this to the government, and they all said, oh, very good, very good, and then did nothing about it. So for a year, I would go back to the municipal commissioner and say, so I had presented this report, and uh, the commissioner would get transferred or changed, and the next man in would, would uh, again say, oh, that's a very wonderful you know, report that you've done, but nothing happened on site. So what I eventually did was I started visiting this site, I mean this road, thrice a week, and I would target three buildings and go and meet the shopkeepers and show them images that you can have three billboards and, and three arches, or you can put them, you know, one, one shop sign, an arch. And eventually what we did was create something called the Heritage Mile Association, which just became a group, a motley crew of people who were either shopkeepers or or banks or business houses in that area, and right from Valiji's luggage to McDonald's. And we sort of cobbled together a loose association and said that let's set a benchmark and set a target. And we set Diwali that year as our target. And we said, let's do this voluntarily without asking for government support, without asking for government funding, and let everybody change their signboard to fit the regulations. And some did voluntarily, and some were shamed into doing it. So McDonald's wasn't uh, the most cooperative. So I would go back to the McDonald's uh, restaurant every, every Wednesday and come back with pictures of McDonald's on Bond Street in London or McDonald's near Parthenon or McDonald's in, uh, in Rome and say, you know, you have a tiny little M. It's barely visible. But why do you do this huge sign in Bombay? Do you think, you know, we're not, we're not first world enough? And we sort of almost shamed them and embarrassed them to be able to remove this. And then one said, oh my god, there were arches behind this. And I think one by one, what really happened is just through a process of negotiation, no government uh, you know, license department or no, no really uh, governmental intervention, we managed to one by one clean up these arches. And then uh, a brave lady, a gynecologist by profession, filed a public interest litigation in the Bombay High Court against the visual pollution of billboards in heritage areas. And uh, at that point, I was on the heritage committee. And uh, one more member and I, we volunteered that we would go to every billboard in South Bombay and write for the, for the High Court a, a report on why it needs to go and what are the reasons that it shouldn't be there. And when we prepared this whole dossier and submitted it to the High Court, the Municipal Commissioner, in fact, overruled us and wrote a paragraph in defense of these, saying that, like Times Square, billboards add to the beauty and the dynamism of this city. And for once, uh, the High Court sided with us as, as uh, citizens rather than uh, the government and uh, struck down this. And we all had a party when, when this billboard was removed because this is the blitz 
billboard had been there, it was almost a heritage landmark by itself because every month it would have the latest gossip in the film world and it had been there for 50 years. And when we removed this, we could actually see the windows. And there were some buildings that never got sunlight for decades. So when you stripped this building, they could, I mean, the, the, the people living inside it suddenly said, and there was light. So, so this is what, it cost the government nothing. But what it did was really clean up a whole um, center of town. And then we, instead of going to the government to ask them for funding the street furniture, we went back to the shopkeepers. So the association asked every shopkeeper to pay for the cast iron street furniture outside his shop. So whether it was a small business like Valiji's Luggage or a spectacle shop like Lawrence and Mayo or a bigger business house like Deutsche Bank or Citibank, each one paid for the stretch of cobblestone and cast iron furniture outside their shop or their building. And what it did is there's a sense of entitlement and there's a sense of responsibility and ownership. So if somebody is spitting on the cast iron bench that you have paid for, you will jolly well out, you know, shout out and say, hey, don't do that. So I think that is something that we were able to do, not because of some great idea, because of adversity, because nobody else was willing to pay for it. So I think Bombay just created its own language of dealing with heritage buildings. And that also happens because unlike a city like Delhi or Agra where there's these great monuments and they're sort of, the national monuments and they're fenced off and as a citizen you're only able to see the monument between sunrise and sunset and then a chokidar or a watchman comes and locks it up and, you know, shoes you away. There's not that sense of connect with a monument because you see it in isolation. But in Colombo and Bombay, uh, we often have a very intimate relationship with our colonial buildings. Because in Bombay, if you are born uh, in Bombay, chances are pretty good that the, build, the hospital would be a heritage building. It would probably be a Victorian building. Uh, when you go to school, most likely it's a historic building. When you go to college, Elphinstone or Xavier's or so many other colleges would be uh, beautiful 19th century Victorian buildings. If you are in litigation, the High Court or the Sessions Court would be a historic building. If you die, uh, the morgue's probably going to be a historic building. Every day when you take a train from work to office, you're going through Bandra Station or Victoria Terminus Station. So what you're really doing is, is engaging with history and historic buildings every day. And I think that's so important for a city, for citizens to have an engagement with their heritage, to be able to, for it to continue its relevance in contemporary society. And therefore, this is a map of South Bombay. And these little zones are are little NGOs and citizen groups that work in those areas. They do not look for government funding. They create their own funding, their own revenue streams, and then very jealously guard those areas. So these are little pockets where these are not individually very great buildings, but when you see them collectively. So if you see an Art Deco building, you'll see much better Art Deco buildings in, in Paris or Miami or London, but nowhere else do you have this entire marine drive and back bay reclamation together, which then sings a different story. So that, to my mind, is really, and so over, over the decades, one has been involved with some of these guidelines through, through citizen groups. And this is a small area, which is a little precinct in that, in, that uh, uh, in South Bombay, which is called Horniman Circle. And it's, it seems like Regent's Park or a little crescent in Bath. And it was built in uh, the middle of the 19th century, 50 years before Connaught Place in Delhi was conceived, and as a business district. And this was the condition of most of the buildings, because, because of rent control, the owner, in this case, the Botawala Trust, was earning barely, you know, $10 from every tenant who, and obviously was not interested in, in restoring the building or looking after it. So a bunch of our citizens got together and we formed the Horniman Circle Association. And we went uh, under the Urban Design Research Institute banner. We presented to the Reserve Bank of India, which is right in the area. And we said that in a walking distance of 
two kilometers, there are 33 banks in the area. So if every bank even gives us one lakh rupee, that's 100,000 rupees, we would earn enough to be able to restore the whole circle. And then we found out that banks are not the most generous of institutions, because out of those 33 that came, only six actually wrote us checks. So we had, in 1998, uh, a great amount of money, which is six lakh rupees, which you can spend doing up one bathroom renovation, put in jacuzzi, put in some nice fancy finishes and, and, and fittings. So what we said is we'll take up as part of the public realm of Honeman Circle is the facade. And while people are willing to pay for the interior renovation of their offices, they're not willing to pay for the collective facade. So we will look at the public realm which affects the citizen. So we will restore the facade. And uh, with six lakh rupees, we restored the facade. It was a simple lime wash. We got rid of uh, the ficus and, and did some dentistry repair to the limestone. But what it did was really we targeted this. These are beautiful code stone um, keystones of carved human figures. And they could barely be seen because of the whole clutter of signboards. But while we were restoring the facade, we made it, you know, we made it almost conditional that the tenants would not would allow us to change the, the signboards just so that it would conform to a simple scheme. And that's all we did, and we just restored two buildings. But what it did is set off a trend. And today, this area has, the f has Christian Louboutin. So one pair of shoes can probably pay for the whole facade restoration budget that we had. It has Hermes, one scarf is more expensive than what we spent on the whole building. But what it's really done is without relying on government funds, it created a system, and an economic engine for the revival of this area. Uh, another such area within Bombay is Kala Ghoda. And uh, again, around the same time, 98, um, I was invited to tea at the Tata headquarters, Bombay House, by, uh, by a very venerable old gentleman called Sharukh Sabawala, who was the great who is the grandson of a Parsi philanthropist called Kawasji Jahangir. Now the story of Bombay is very unique because unlike Delhi or Calcutta, which were capital cities and the buildings were paid for by the Raj or government endowment, Bombay was always a financial capital. So most of these buildings that you see here were not paid by government, but were, were paid through public subscription or through what we call merchant princes. So Elphinstone College was largely funded by Kawasji Jahangir, who was such a philanthropist that they often called him Kawasji Jahangir ready money because he was always ready with money. Uh, we have next to it the little uh, building which looks like a little church is the David Sassoon Library, which was funded by uh, a Baghdadi Jew who started as a carpet seller and then became one of the richest merchants and shipbuilders of Bombay. So each building was built through, through individual effort and not through government. And therefore, we all felt that it was our collective duty to be able to restore this area, not looking at government funding. So what we did, and the, that was a motley crew. We were six people that included Rahul Merotra, uh, who's an urban designer, Shirin Barucha, who's a lawyer, uh, Radhika Sabawala, who's a publisher of Marg, uh, Mr. Sharukh Sabawala, and a couple of us, others. So we did a simple survey of the area, and we found that with, with the Prince of Wales Museum and the Jahangir Art Gallery and a few other galleries, there was an existing 100,000 square foot of gallery space already. So we said, let's pick a time of the year when it's a comfortable time, when it's not raining or when it's not too hot, and when people are not partying in Goa. And so we picked the first two weekends of February. And let's print a calendar of events that just combines all that's happening in all these galleries and create a platform that puts it together. And then the second thing that we decided was that we will bring art outside the confines of galleries and rooms and we will use everything from pavements to this triangular central car parking lot as art spaces. So we, all we asked the government was to pedestrianize this area for two weekends and art spilled out on the street and cultural performances spilled out on the street and for the first Kalagora festival in 98 we had the likes of Ustad Zakir Hussain perform on his tabla to a free audience and we didn't charge any tickets. But what we did do 
out of that money, I mean, we had no money really. What we did was earn a lot of goodwill. So we went to HSBC Bank and said, will you give us ten lakh, five lakh rupees? So they said, all right, only if it is matched by someone else. We went to the Dorab Tata Trust and got another five lakh rupees. So we got 10 lakh rupees and then decided like almost in a foolhardy way to restore the biggest building that there was. So right behind that statue is the Elphinstone College, which is the longest facade in the area. And this is what it looked like. And we said, we have 10 lakh rupees and we're going to restore this, but it doesn't belong to us. It belonged to the government of Maharashtra. So a bunch of us went and met the government and said, we are an NGO, we're just born, we're barely a year old, we have money and we have conservation skills. We will restore this building for you. You just sign a memorandum of understanding with us that after restoring it, we will give it back to you, but allow us to do it our way. And somebody in the government was open to the idea and said, that's fine. So we started this and we restored it and gave it back to, uh, to the government. And this is one of the finest colleges, Elphinstone College. And it was this that what, I mean, somebody in the conservation world said that it's better to give a church to the hands of the infidel than the public works department. So this was true of what had happened over a hundred years to this building because every few years they would have another coat of oil paint and the electrical wiring was going all over the place and that's what, so just minimal changes brought back these Victorian spaces to life. And this is the entrance lobby. And one had always seen it like this baffled ceiling, which looked like a concrete baffle ceiling and tube lights. And then we started scraping and we found some 50 layers of oil paint and it was really this beautiful rich Burma teak. So it didn't take new interventions, it just did some undoing. And over the last nearly 25 years, I've realized that conservation is sometimes more about undoing the wrongs than doing something really brilliant. There's no genius to conservation. It's just trying to undo the damage that we've done to our buildings. And now Kalagora has, has really become one of the largest cultural events on the calendar of the Indian art scene. But it's con it celebrates contemporary art. It celebrates, uh, it has poetry readings in the gardens of of uh, uh, David Sassoon Library, we have morning ragas in the Prince of Wales Museum, we have book uh, readings, we have all sorts of crazy uh, you know, uh, pop-up restaurants that open up in the, on the road. So this becomes, in a sense, it's become a celebration of the city by the citizens. And so we've had heritage walk, heritage cycling tours, heritage bus rides, uh, and all sorts of cultural performances where citizens and artists from all over India, some of the finest artists, have performed. And what it has also done is recycle spaces. So a space like the town hall, an Asiatic library, which has this tremendous staircase uh, of stone, is used as a performance auditorium because it suits us. It doesn't. We, it's cheap. We don't have to, buy, you know, even rent chairs. Uh, or it becomes a venue. It changes the way you perceive it because it becomes a venue for a children's event. And all this has, over the last uh, nearly 20 years, also created the uh, the motivation to one by one restore these buildings. So this is the town hall. And uh, over the last four years, we've been working on this right from, you know, this is what it looked like. And this, this is some of the, it's gone on auto mode. I'm sorry, it seems to be having a life of its own. So this is the central library. And this is the library that is open to the public and the poorest children come here to study because in a city like Bombay where you don't, in a one room tenement, you have 10 people living. Children can't even study for their board exams in peace. So they often come here to just sit quietly and study for their exams. But this had been taken over by steel cupboards. And all this was also severely stressing the, the loading of the building. And then over the years, the columns had been painted lavender, pink, purple, all sorts of shades, whatever took the fancy of everyone. And then once we started the restoration, we found that these were actually cast iron columns that had been imported in 1833 and therefore were a good three decades older than the Watson's Hotel or Crawford Market, which were at one time considered to be the oldest cast iron buildings. So what we have done is through government money, but citizens pushing through, uh, being able to restore this building. And yes, then when we were running short of funds, not because of shortage of funds, but because it's very difficult under government regulations to 
design chandeliers and to propose chandeliers uh, because how do you do a rate analysis of a new chandelier which does not fall under the schedule of rates of government of Maharashtra. So we finally, I was, I was asked by the Rotary Club to give a talk and I, I negotiated a bit and I said, I'll come for your Sunday lunch talk or Tuesday talk, lunch talk if uh, you bid for, the, for, for uh, donating the chandeliers. So over one lunch, we got three bids to donate three chandeliers. So there was a little bit of public in, uh, you know, involvement in the restoration. So now this hall is back to looking the way it should have and it's been given back to the city and it's again being used by students and the tube lights have gone and the chandeliers are here and uh, Thankfully, the steel cupboards are gone. And uh, sorry, Dayanita, <laughs> you weren't able to photograph all the, the mess before <laughs> we cleaned this one up. Uh, but that's the story of most of our public buildings, and I'm sure that's the story of most of our public buildings across the subcontinent, not just, uh, not just India. Uh, and uh, so just small baby steps which help uh, conserving structures. This is the JJ School of Art and the JJ School of Art is one of the oldest uh, educational institutions uh, within Bombay, within India, 1857. And uh, the same thing happened that over time everything got painted and uh, the, the government would look after the fact that the building would not collapse but beyond that there was no, uh, no um, value addition. So here a bunch of uh, citizens came up with an innovative idea and they set up something called the Friends of JJ. Uh, they got Pandit Ravi Shankar to give a concert and a sitar recital and on that day auctioned artwork by some of the students and raised about 18 lakh rupees and then invited the member of parliament uh, and sort of nudged him and cajoled him to f giving the rest of the money required which is about 40 lakh rupees and the government through the parliament, member parliament funds and for a year we were stuck, this is 2004, because the government of India said that member parliament's fund can be used to build a toilet, build a structure, buy computers, but not restore an old building. So it took us a year to convince the government that member funds can, should and can be used for heritage buildings. And that was, took a lot of back and forth, a lot of bureaucratic red tape, but what it did was create the first project where MP funds could be used for historic buildings. And this is what it looks like. Uh, it wasn't a very large amount of money, but what it did was bring, bring a sense of pride back to the students, at least in the workspace and the studios they were working in. And another educational building of that uh, kind was the Convocation Hall. And this is what it looked like one year before the 150th year. And this has been designed by Sir Gilbert Scott, who was England's probably the busiest and the most prolific architect. And since he was so busy uh, working in his practice in England, he never came to the site, which is a big lesson for all us architects, <laughs> because he, through a series of letters and correspondence with the Senate members, he just sent his drawings one day because he got a nasty letter from, again, Kawasji Jangi, Ready Money, to the Senate which said, Two years ago, I gave you one lakh rupees. You have done nothing, so kindly return the money with interest. And that sort of, they put enough pressure on Gilbert Scott to send out through the ship uh, a series of drawings. But what I imagine is that he really cut corners because instead of building a convocation hall, he just probably sent out drawings of a, of a, a church that he must have already got on his uh, table somewhere because it's really like a church. And uh, as a result, the voice echoes. So when you have a lecture hall, when it's a church and you hear the voice of God echoing, it's wonderful. But if it's a lecture hall and there's so much echo, it's rather disturbing. So for years, for over 80 years, every minutes of the Senate recorded how poor the acoustics were. And then suddenly they stopped complaining about the acoustics of this hall in one letter of 1944. So when I was rummaging through all the old archival um, correspondence and as you can see when we started work on the project the whole vault was leaking and and there were these patches of gray powder falling and the 1944 letter said and lo and behold we have addressed the matter of poor acoustics because now we have covered the entire stone vault with limpet asbestos so what happened since 19 from 1944 to 2005 that all the students and professors were merrily inhaling asbestos so our project had to do a course correction and do a complete asbestos abatement of the ceiling 
And within a year after restoring the Minton tiles and the stained glass and the, the vaulted ceiling, uh, we did win a UNESCO award for this project. And then another such educational building, which was a girls' school, and then went completely dysfunctional, I mean, derelict, because this was a Marathi, a vernacular language girls' school, and then there was no constituency for a vernacular language girls' school, so the girls stopped coming. And they were down to six students, so they finally shut down. And then we got uh, a, a steel magnet's wife, who was interested in art, to say that I will fund the restoration of this if this becomes a women's art institute. So this building was restored, and it's now a very dynamic art institute. Um, another such project, which is a tiny little project, uh, is Upadastra, which was this one building which was not listed. And uh, so that, over time, then got the government thinking. And I think we sort of, they realized that a lot of this is happening in our city, but it's happening through the citizens' realm, not through government. And finally, the municipal corporation, which is, which is a very rich municipal corporation, decided that they will clean up their building and restore it. And it's one of the finest Victorian buildings, also designed by the same architect who designed the Victoria Terminus. And this was just full of files and papers and more files and uh, and over years, it had, this was the condition, and more tube lights and more wiring. And this has been a 10-year-long project because for a 3 lakh square foot building and in a functioning municipal office, we were never able to even vacate one floor or half a floor. So we literally had to say, sir, we've got to repair the Minton tile below your desk, so may we over a weekend move your desk and repair the tile. So that was a level of negotiation where we finally got the corridors restored, all these spaces on the top were used by the clerical staff. So rather than have these spaces used by the clerical staff, because when it rained, they would just collect water in buckets, we convinced the municipal commissioner that you are the, the biggest officer. If you move to the top floor, the moment there's one drop of water, uh, the whole agency would spring into action. So the municipal commissioner decided his office would be on the top floor, and these were turned into conference rooms. And then you have these magnificent 24 feet high spaces which work better when there's more public coming rather than just an office. And finally, I'm going to close with this project which is again back into something of a private uh, effort which was the only opera house in India, which is the Royal Opera House. And this building was built in 1916 by uh, Karaka and Brandman who were two theater enthusiasts. And by the year 2006, it had been declared unsafe and, uh, by the municipal corporation. And it was owned by a private owner, the Maharaja Saab, erstwhile Maharaja of Gondal. And this was the condition of, of the theater. It was in bad shape because this was a 20th, early 20th century construction that used uh, steel and lime and stone and sort of was a, you know, a mix of different materials. But what had happened was that because people stopped going to single the screen theaters. They did not know, they no longer wanted to go watch a film with a fan. They wanted an air conditioning space. They wanted a multiplex. There was no, uh, there was, there were, there, it wasn't selling any tickets. And finally it just sort of went into disrepair and closed down for 23 years. And this was the interior of the Art Deco cinema. But since it was 1916, I, I, I could never reconcile why a 1916 structure had an Art Deco interior. And then we started peeling off the layers and finding, looking for old photographs and old documents. And we found that this was really covering up an old Rococo interior. And this is how it's been restored back. And uh, the balconies have been put back in. And now it's... Uh, for the last one year, this is the owner, Amara Nisab, and they have done it purely through their own funds as a leap of faith because we were still weren't sure whether single screen theaters would make money. So it's gone back to being a performance theater. And in the last eight months since it's been up and running, we've had opera, we've had fashion shows, we've had film festivals, we've had all sorts of interesting things. And uh, here we found an old photograph which it has been restored to. And what it has really done is, again, proven that if you do have faith and no money and no government support, you can still make conservation happen. Thank you. Well, Abba, thank you for a wonderful and inspiring presentation. 
Uh, I'm sure uh, everyone here might have a question or two, uh, so you can't really escape. Uh, so for the next few minutes, if anybody has any questions from Abba, I, I mean, she's been so clear about what she's done, and I must say, uh, I have seen some of that work, and it's quite brilliant, and I just wish uh, we had a group of people like her uh, who might possibly help us save some of the stuff that we have. Uh, so if there's any questions... Chana, it just takes string hoppers and crab, and I'm happy to move. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone who can donate some string hoppers and crab, and we'll have her here leading us in our charge to save our own buildings. Um, but if there's any questions you have, uh, would anyone, you, you're free to ask for the next maybe five, ten minutes. If not, we can, you, can, you can talk to her uh, when we meet for our tea uh, and, and cake, I suppose, after this. Any questions? <laughs> Just a minute. <laughs> well, perhaps there are no questions, and perhaps you can talk to her later. Uh, so, Abba, really, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation and for coming out here. Uh, to be with us uh, and, and for inspiring us all, hopefully, uh, to look back at our past in a much more positive way. Uh, I've been myself grappling with this sort of thing for the last year or so, uh, and I think, Waruna, you're, you're there. Perhaps we can be inspired by what she has been doing. Uh, so thank you very much, Abba. Uh, I also need to thank a couple of other people. Um, first of all, and most importantly, Miles Young, who's here after many years of uh, helping the Trust uh, stage this particular event. Uh, Miles, thank you really very much for uh, your completely generous support um, for uh, the memorial lecture. It's, I can't remember how many years it's been, but uh, you've been wonderful. Uh, so Miles, thank you very much for your generosity. I think uh, he, he deserves a round of applause. Uh, and of course, I need to thank our own manager, Priyanka, for sort of arranging all of this. She does it virtually single-handed. Uh, so thank you, Priyanka, for all the efforts that you've gone through. And, um, and of course, uh, the staff here at the Sri Lanka Foundation, which we have used for many years now for uh, having this lecture. They've been wonderfully cooperative with us. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, the staff of the Sri Lanka Foundation. And of course, all of you, who every year come out to pay tribute to Jeffrey uh, Bawa and uh, his life uh, for being here and uh, for supporting the work of the Trust uh, over all these years. So once again, thank you all of you uh, and a very good evening. Thank you.